And we are going live, or at least somewhat live, I think, right here uh, on our new YouTube channel, or at least our new Google Hangout. It's Cecil Lammy and Sigma Bloom from footballguys.com. We've got a lot to talk about in terms of the NFL draft, the NFL in general, as the 2013 NFL draft wraps up from Radio City Music Hall. And Bloom, as you can tell by my scruffy appearance, <laughs> it's been a long last three days, yeah. um, but I'm, I'm better, man. I'm better. I'm ready. Yeah, we're all a little punchy, but at the same time still exhilarated. Uh, and in addition to working these hangouts into what we do, we are going to have our division-by-division division podcasts breaking down the draft. The original draft, the original Audible, the first Audible, was us breaking down the draft division-by-division. Division. So it's kind of like back to the 12 o'clock on the clock, right? Right. Um, and uh, this is fun, though. Uh, it, it certainly, I think that these Google Hangouts, they give us the opportunity to break down film with everybody out there. They give us the opportunity to show you what we're looking at sometimes uh, that is informing us. And I'm excited, man. I'm excited for what the 21st century has to offer the Audible. Yeah, it's going to be a lot of fun doing these Google Hangouts. And as we continue on, we'll learn more about the process, more about the tools we're able to use here on Google Hangouts. So make sure you stay tuned, as always, to the Audible. Check out footballguys.com. The site redesign has launched today newsletters, rankings, everything and uh, more that you want from a fantasy football site you can get at footballguys.com. Now, 2013 NFL draft, not exactly quarterback heavy up at the top. In fact, only one quarterback taken in the first round. And I know, Bloom, there was a lot of people kind of curious, you know, at Buffalo's pick of EJ Manuel. I'll say this much. We knew that Kevin Cobb wasn't the long-term answer. And when you look at a Doug Marone system, I had assumed, as many had, all right, you move and you get 16, you're going to take Ryan Nassib instead. They go with EJ Manuel. Now, EJ Manuel, who we've talked plenty about on the show, is a player that has the highest ceiling in this entire draft class. He's incredibly athletic. He's got a rocket arm. Uh, and he does a good job of keeping his eyes downfield when he's on the move. Here's the problem that I see with Manuel at this time, is that he makes one read, and then he gets on the move. Uh, and once in a while, he'll throw on the run. But most of the time, his rushing skills are so elite that he really relies on those legs more so than uh, on his arm, his very elite arm in terms of that arm strength. I like his velocity. He had a great senior bowl, and, and he's a guy that really gets Bills fans excited. Bloom, does the fit get you excited with Buffalo here taking him in the first round? Yeah, and it's because of what came after. Uh, and and we talked about I talked about this with Matt Waldman on the couch last week. Uh, as you said, you know, athleticism, size, arm strength, I think even touch and natural feel throwing the ball are all pluses for EJ Manuel. Some people question the mental side of the game. They question his ability to identify blitzes and go through progressions and things like that. And EJ Manuel is going to be uh, a referendum, if you will, on whether 11 on 11 offensive football really makes the job of the passer easier or if it's just the Russell Wilson, Rob Griffin III, and Colin Kaepernick are awesome quarterbacks. And it didn't matter what system you put them in. I think there's enough reason with Marone and his visionary uh, ability on offense, and NASA is a whole other thing, but obviously, you know, Greg Cosell, Russ Landy, Mike Mayock, right. love those guys. Uh, he may end up being the best quarterback in the draft, but teams didn't think so. Um, but what you love about E.J. Manuel is it, it clearly appears to me that Doug Marone is going for a full court press, speed based, up tempo offense, just like he had at Syracuse with the read option. Look, if you're running read option for Ryan Nassib, you uh, believe the read option is a very important part of an offense. EJ Manuel can run it like Colin Kaepernick runs it. Then you have the speed of Marquise Goodwin, the speed of TJ Graham, Stevie Johnson, his clutch hands, Derek Rogers. I mean, Derek Rogers could be. And that big receiver, he could be what James Hardy never was for Buffalo. <laughs> right. And C.J. Spiller. Oh, by the way, C.J. Spiller. So from a fantasy standpoint, defenses, okay, when E.J. Manuel puts that ball in the belly of C.J. Spiller, who are you going to follow? Are you going to follow E.J. Manuel? Are you going to be afraid of E.J. Manuel when C.J. Spiller's right next to him? No way. So E.J. Manuel is going to have a lot of running lanes. Really, the only hesitation you should have taking him in at the late first round of a rookie draft is if you think he's just going to be a bust, a total and complete bust. Because if he hits with the makings they have in terms of weapons and the philosophy of Doug Marone, he could be right there with Wilson and Colin Kaepernick in fantasy numbers by the end of year two. 
Well, it's one thing that you always compliment these teams on is clarity. And with yeah. Buffalo, at least, hey, we're going to see if it's going to work out with EJ Manuel at quarterback. But at least we see clarity. We see a vision uh, from this team on what they want to be. And that's an, a very a very exciting uh, yeah. vision of what the Bills could be, especially compared to what we've seen in recent years. Now, in the second round, only one quarterback, and it was the quarterback many assumed, hey, if there's only going to be one guy in the first, it's got to be Geno Smith, right? Well, it wasn't. He stuck around in New York City, was there at Radio City Music Hall on the second day of the draft. He goes to the New York Jets, and the Timmy thing, we already know he's been released this morning. But you look at Geno Smith uh, with this offense, and I would automatically put him in the starting lineup over Mark Sanchez. Yes. If Sanchez makes it that far, uh, you know, they'll paint it as for veteran respect. We're going to have a competition here. We're going to see what these guys can do and compete against each other. But in the end, this is a power move to make Geno Smith their guy. It's incredible value where they got him. And love or hate Geno Smith or play the middle with Geno Smith, it, it doesn't matter. At this position where they pick him at 39th overall, you have to like the value for that team. Here's something that I thought was interesting. Mike Tanier from SportsOnEarth.com, formerly with the New York Times, one of the best and funniest, brightest guys out there, he said the New York media was hard for Geno two days ago. You know, right. What's it going to be like actually now that he's with the squad and with the team? Let's look at the fit. First off, as we've talked about many times, Bloom, they're getting an intelligent quarterback, one that does put uh, the football in a good place for his wide receivers to do something with it after the catch, a guy that uh, is known for that pass placement on the underneath routes. Mechanically, he gets a little bit flat-footed. His deep passes will sail because of that, and he kind of has this little flick to his throwing motion that uh, he needs to clean up there as well. People talk about the flippant attitude at the combine, and for me, I'll rewind it back from the combine, or I'll say at the Senior Bowl. You know, it, to me, in my opinion, this is just me, and you know, Phil Savage would agree. When you're not the clear-cut number one guy in a draft class as a senior, you play at the Senior Bowl because when you don't, and you're Geno Smith, and you're kind of in the mix of being that number one guy, but you're not the clear-cut guy then all of a sudden people and draft nicks and scouts begin to question, well, what are you hiding? What are you trying to cover up? Why won't you compete? And for me, I like the guy, like E.J. Manuel. You know, I told the story on the air on ESPN Denver. I'll repeat it now. E.J. Manuel, after the Senior Bowl, where he was outstanding and he was MVP of the game, uh, I was watching ESPN 2 late at night. I turned the channel. It's a quarterback competition from down in Dallas. This was post-Senior Bowl, pre-combine. And it was like 2 in the morning, they were replaying a quarterback competition, and there was E.J. Manuel, like just going to throw at, tar you know, moving targets. And it, it was uh, kind of like the skills competition we used to have back in the day. It was a lot of fun to watch, but that's the type of guy E.J. Manuel is, where they say, hey, skills competition, he says, I'll be there. Senior Bowl, I'll be there. I like that. For Geno Smith, I didn't like the fact that he would avoid the Senior Bowl as he wasn't the clear-cut guy. We see him fall to 2. How's the fit with the Jets? How does things? How do things work out for Geno Smith this year in your eyes? Mm -hmm. I, you know, <laughs> I, I don't know. Uh, first, I want to say that I push back to you, Mr. Lammy, whenever uh, you said that you didn't like his interview at the uh, Combine, Geno Smith. I said, well, what does that have to do with anything? Obviously, the vibe he was giving off did rub teams the wrong way. Uh, so kudos to you on, on picking that up when very few people were talking about that. And most people were impressed with his interview. Uh, but there was something there to that. And, and, and in some ways, it will help the Jets that he fell to the second round because they're not wedded to him. You know, it's like Jimmy Clausen. Jimmy Clausen wasn't good in his first year. Carolina moved on, got Cam Newton. So that adds some risk factor to Geno Smith. The New York media, all that other stuff, add, just the Jets seem like a ship run aground. That doesn't help Geno Smith. But from a fantasy standpoint, you have his running ability. He's an incredible athlete, very, very underrated. They, I would imagine they're going to do some read option. I'd imagine they're going to mix things up. Right. With him. So, so there's some upside there and immediate opportunity. It just feels like it's an uphill battle for the kid. So I remember Cam Newton sometimes was falling to the second round of rookie drafts. Now, he didn't go 1-1 like Cam Newton. He doesn't have the upside of Cam Newton. Geno Smith's not going to be the goal line running back for the Jets. But this could be a situation where savvy owners can swoop in in the second round and, and get somebody who has opportunity, has talent. Um, it, it just feels like there's a bad vibe around him right now because of the 
uh, falling in the draft because of the team he ended up on. Uh, this could be an opportunity. I'm still inclined in rookie drafts to take, uh, you know, Christine Michael or even Zach Stacy over Geno Smith. But if he falls too far in rookie drafts, it might be the smart move to snag him. Well, and one thing I said when he walked up on stage at Radio City Music Hall, and uh, I, I just hope this this has gotten to him, okay? Because a lot of players play with that chip on their shoulder. I told the story of Thurman Thomas years ago, a second-round pick, uh, and he hated every team for passing on him, and it made Thurman Thomas, what was it, like five straight years right. that he led the NFL in total yards? It made him one of the greats, obviously made him a Hall of Fame player. So as the Jets fans were going nuts, because obviously at Radio City, that's what they do, uh, but they were excited. They were so over the top, uh, the chance of Geno, we want Geno. That was happening in the first round. They get him in the second round. They're going nuts, and Geno's up there on the stage, and you could see that it bothered him. You could see that it had impacted him. So the one thing I said is I hope this makes him better. I hope he now realizes uh, the mistakes that he's made, the type of attitude that he needs to have to be a successful NFL quarterback. And this will be part of the story with Geno Smith. You know, And, and that's the great right. thing. If this is something that propels him or catapults him towards greatness, well then, good. And, and I believe he, in the end, would say that it's worth it. Now... One, one, and one, one in the first, one in the second, one in the third, and really in that third day you're thinking, or, or in, in the third round, you're thinking, all right, well, here comes Barkley, or here comes Nassib. Nope, Mike Glennon, Tampa Bay Buccaneers. What's interesting to note in talking to people like Jenna Lane or Charlie Bernstein down there in Florida that cover this team, they are not really sold on Josh Freeman. Now they're locked right. into the big money deal with Darrell Rivas, uh, and now Freeman is in a contract year. They want someone to push Josh Freeman uh, in training camp, try to get the best out of him. And if you go back and you look at the numbers, and Bloom, um, you'll have to re refresh my memory which weeks it was, but it was late in the season where he had, what, it was like nine interceptions in two right. games, something like that. Right. Uh, but before that, we'd seen a more consistent Josh Freeman, and obviously the addition of Vincent Jackson was very good for him. Uh, and he had a career year, career numbers, better downfield numbers, uh, better percentage as a passer. You throw in Mike Glennon. This team, what can they really expect from Mike Glennon, a guy that did not impress me at the Senior Bowl? He, he still has a hitch in his drop back, which I think at that point, when you're a senior, you should probably have that taken care of, but he still almost hops when he takes the snap and he drops back. Sure, he's got a rocket arm. But to me, he reminds me a lot of former Browns or Panthers quarterback, Derek Anderson. Big arm, can't throw it in the ocean standing on the beach. So what can the Buccaneers truly expect? If they wanted someone to push Josh Freeman, I don't think that guy is Mike Glennon because he's got mechanical issues and he's not that accurate. Sure, the arm strength is there, but as we've seen with many quarterbacks, it takes more than that. This was a... A curious move. You know, the manual pick, a strong move, showed that clarity that you love, Bloom. The Geno Smith pick, good value. Hopefully it propels him to play better. The Mike Glennon pick left me going, why? For who? For what? Yeah, while Glennon's accuracy has dropped off, honestly, it's his decision-making that really bothers me. Uh, I think that still you look at it, and the fit makes sense because like Josh Freeman, you – question Josh Freeman's decision making even <laughs> even when his decision making was even when his numbers were good his decision making still seemed questionable but because they have Vincent Jackson and Mike Williams you just throw the ball above the rim and let these guys do what they do and Glennon is good with that Glennon has no conscience when it comes to that um, and, and then you make some throws and you think what was he doing but unlike Freeman he's no athleticism so that could be his fatal flaw. Uh, but I think that the I'm not a Glennon fan. I'm not going to advocate taking Glennon rookie drafts and stashing him. But I do think that this does show you that Josh Freeman, it, with, there were whispers about it. There were a few little stories about it because they weren't going to extend it. They weren't going to push for an extension. Now I think this drives home. This is that manifestation of they're not sold on him. They need him to sell them on him this year. Uh, so that's the story that we'll be watching. I think if they have to turn to Mike Glennon, it will just be a temporary bridge. But hey, we're going to carry on to Derek Anderson. Derek Anderson had a good year, and what did he do? Just like Mike Glennon would have a chance to do, throw it to these guys. It was Winslow and Vince and uh, um, Braylon Edwards in Cleveland, and in Tampa, again, it would be Mike Williams, and it 
would be Vincent Jackson. So maybe Glennon could have a glimmer until teams figure out there's about a billion ways to beat him. <laughs> well, let's move on to the final day in the 2013 NFL Draft. The fourth round was the quarterback run, uh, and really some interesting quarterbacks, maybe some not-so-interesting quarterbacks. Uh, and Pittsburgh, <clears throat> Landry Jones, okay. We'll talk about that later. Fourth Matt Barkley going there, top of the the uh, fourth round, excuse me, to the Philadelphia Eagles. Some people at first were saying, why? How does this work? Chip Kelly's system, why Matt Barkley here? Well, again, a little bit of clarity from Barkley. And I've got some numbers, Bloom. I'll figure out the screen share thing later, but I'm reading it here uh, off my page. Since the 2011 season, last couple of years, Matt Barkley has thrown 24 touchdown passes of 20 yards or longer and has only thrown two interceptions in 120 attempts of that distance. When Barkley did miss his receivers on the deep passes, he was four times more likely to overthrow than underthrow him. So while deep passes for Barkley will have that flutter there at the end, obviously those type of numbers, and that's you know 2011 and the disappointing 2012 season. Speaking of that, because we know Chip Kelly's system all about it's really built on the ground game. It's also built on quick decisions from the quarterback and also some rollouts from the quarterback as well. Barkley completed over 65% of his passes with 23 touchdowns and three interceptions when outside of the pocket in his career, including 16 touchdowns on designed rollouts. So the numbers, the game matches up a little bit better than the initial swipe because there was surprise, surprise overreaction on social networking about this pick. But when you really look at it, looks like old Chip Kelly may uh, may have may be onto something here. Bloom, what do you think? He is onto something, and, and, and you have to give them a lot of credit for this. Uh, we did see Daniel Jeremiah, our man who worked in the Eagles organization, tell us that Howie Roseman loved Mac Barkley last year. Okay, Eagles jumped ahead of the Chiefs and and uh, the Raiders to get Matt Barkley. There's some signs that the Raiders in particular, and there were a lot of people who really believed, like from sources, the Chiefs were going to take Barkley. Chiefs say no. Nico Johnson, the thumper, was the pick. But so there's your conviction. I know it's a fourth-round pick, and we can bring in fourth-round hit rate of quarterbacks and all that right. stuff. But it doesn't matter. Look, and a couple of things come to mind here. I think this is a really fascinating pick, and it illustrates some things for us. One, as Chip Kelly said, he's going to fit the scheme to his personnel, not the personnel to his scheme. Doesn't necessarily have to be a mobile quarterback. We thought, based on how things went at Oregon, that that was the plan. Well, you know, he's got mobile quarterbacks in Dixon and Vic, and he's got pocket West Coast offense passers like Foles and Barkley. Uh, so you know they love Barkley. I, I believe they said late first, early second round grade on Barkley on their board. Uh, and what, the other thing it shows you is the one thing that won't change in the Chip Kelly offense is tempo. It's going to be a quick tempo. But, again... Pat Shermer, offensive coordinator, West Coast offense guru. That shows me that the quickness isn't necessarily in the footwork of, well, maybe the footwork, but the feet or the running ability of the quarterback. It's in the mind of the quarterback. And I think this was brought up on one of the broadcasts, I think NFL Network broadcast. And Matt Barkley does have a quick mind. Matt Barkley will be able to spread the ball out and do a lot of things. The other thing you know about these Chip Kelly offenses is going to be an onslaught of the number of plays. Um, which is great for the running backs, LaShawn McCoy, but it makes Barkley a very intriguing quarterback. And Chip Kelly, like Pete Carroll, and I believe him, is going to have a true open competition. Uh, you know, if we're talking about grasping concepts and being ready to hit the field in a Chip Kelly offense, you know, I mean, Michael Vick, we'll see. Matt Barkley, I think, is going to – he could get to the head of the class. He could be that, that teacher's pet, you know. I, this is a very intriguing pick. I, I love what they did here, and what did they really risk? I mean, if Matt Barkley's arm strength or athleticism or whatever is a problem, so what? Fourth-round pick. I think, on the whole, as an aside, the team's way overreacted to letting quarterbacks drop. Look at the quarterbacks that have gone in the third round in the past, la past 10 years. Brody Croyle, Charlie Whitehurst, Kevin O'Connell, David Green. Come on. These guys are, are they're better pro. Ryan Nassib and Landry Jones and uh, Matt Barkley are better. Matt Scott, who didn't even get drafted, is a better pro prospect than some of these quarterbacks. I'm talking about comparing apples to apples when they were coming out in, uh, in that draft. Right. So I, I, like the, I like that the Steelers, the, the smart organizations, Eagles, Steelers, Giants, you guys are going to leave us 
solid backup. Back, good backup quarterbacks get paid $3 million plus a year. It shows you the value of a good backup quarterback. Nassib, Barkley, and even Landry Jones will project to be adequate to good backups at worst, right? I mean, at worst, they're going to be – look at some of the backup quarterbacks around the league right now. Graham Harrell, I love you. You know, you know, you know why, where, where was Green Bay? Where was Green Bay, you know? Right. Um, so I think that the smart organizations realized this, swooped in and got the value. The Giants also traded up to get Nassib. They swooped in. They saw the value here because the NFL, I mean, I get it. Let's not overdraft quarterbacks, but let's not act like they all have leprosy either. Exactly. Very well put, Sigmund. Uh, and in fact, the fourth round featured one of my favorite quarterbacks and my top quarterback, Matt Waldman's as well, and Tyler Wilson we'll get to in just a second. Well, Ryan Nassib is there for the Giants. And again, you're always just a hit away. You're always just a play away from needing your backup quarterback, Nassib. Is a little bit curious why it wasn't with Marone. Do you think anything about that, Bloom? Like, well, if his own college coach didn't take him, uh, you know, is there something there for that? As far as where they got him, it's fine. It's the fourth round. You needed someone behind Eli, Eli Manning to groom and to develop. I think that's a smart thing for all these teams. We'll get to Zach Dysart a little bit later. But it, it's a smart thing for the Giants to pick up NASA. Yeah. How do you like the fit? It's a great fit. I mean, he drafted his teammate, Justin Pugh, in the first round, right? So they, they get some inside information. Um, and as far as Marone not taking Nassib, again, look at what Marone did at Syracuse. He ran read option. Ryan Nassib is not a read option quarterback. Ryan Nassib's deep accuracy was also so-so. Now, so was E.J. Manuel's at Florida, but E.J. Manuel has that easy deep ball. You know, he, he does not take he can let go of a deep ball on the run and all kinds of weird platforms and arm slots. Uh, and that's just something that Ryan Nassib can't do. So I think that it's just, you saw from the design of the offense what Marone wanted to do, but there was a better quarterback than Nassib at doing those things. Uh, but David Carr is old and, you know, David Carr, yeah, maybe he, by the time, maybe he hangs around long enough for his little brother to get in the league, right? Um, <laughs> You look, you know, this is a great pick for them. You know, they see now that teams can turn these backup quarterbacks if they develop them well into a second or third round pick uh, later on down the line. Never hurts. Plus, Eli Manning, I mean, Eli Manning and Ben Roethlisberger and Phillip Rivers are all at the point in their career, hence the Landry Drones pick, too, that you start thinking about the future at quarterback. Maybe you don't make plans right away, but you start thinking about it. So I love what the Giants did there. I think the Steelers getting Landry Jones was a solid move on the same uh, level. And Tyler Wilson, I'll just jump right into Tyler Wilson real quick too. The thing I like about Tyler Wilson to the Raiders is if you build an offense to suit what Matt Flynn can do, you're automatically building it to suit what Tyler Wilson can do. Similar issues, arm strength, deep ball accuracy. Well, we're really just getting the ball there on the deep ball, a problem but quick thinker, mentally tough, kind of a West Coast offense-style quarterback. So I think Matt Flynn and Tyler Wilson, if they're smart, if Dennis Allen's smart, again, open competition. And poor Matt Flynn is like, again? Right. Like, can I just get a year where it's my job? But instead, it appears uh, that Tyler Wilson's going to have a chance to unseat him and, and maybe pretty early. Well, and with Matt Flynn, it's another Wilson. It's another yeah, quarterback. I know, it's another I Wilson. Know. Behind Wilson. Him, a rookie I don't know if everyone saw that. That could push him and perhaps win the starting job. Listen, I've I've made uh, it's no mystery what I think of Ted Thompson for several reasons, and it's no mystery what I think of Reggie McKenzie either. I believe that he will get the Raiders back on the right track. I like a lot of what the Raiders did in the NFL draft. We'll talk about that on a different show. But the Tyler Wilson pick to add that tough quarterback who has the gunslinger mentality, the never say die attitude that Tyler Wilson has to go with his leadership ability is a very vocal guy, a guy who will take charge in situations. When the chips are down, Tyler Wilson's the type of player that shows up big. And I'll rewind a couple of years ago to the Alabama game. It was Courtney Upshaw coming unblocked in a red zone situation. And this is one of many plays. And that Alabama game had several of them. Upshaw comes in unblocked absolutely destroys Wilson, and he made the throw to Kobe Hamilton back of the end zone. Uh, you know, that's the type of toughness you're getting. You're getting that quarterback that knows, I, I'm barely going to get this pass off. He's going to be able to make that pass, and he's going to get blown up, and he's a guy who does not care about that. And, you know, that's a positive and a negative because he plays with little regard for his personal safety, something that will have to clean up, in addition to cleaning up his footwork and that, bit, that big 
leg uh, that uh, John Gruden quarterback camp showed very well. We'll move on. You brought up Landry Jones. Let me know if you have any thoughts there or any of the rest of these quarterbacks. Sean Renfrey from Duke late, if we wrap up all the seventh rounders together. Uh, Renfrey's very intriguing because as you've been talking, talking about these quarterbacks processors a quarterbacks like a computer they've got to have that fast processor you look at Renfrey a very smart quarterback uh, and a quarterback that was going to compete in the all-star circuit this year but had an injury situation out of a, a surprise pick BJ Daniels from South Florida for the 49ers in the seventh round Zach Dysert from Miami of Ohio goes to the Denver Broncos it will be interesting to see he is zero threat to Brock Osweiler I want to be I'm going to make that clear for anyone out there that's saying they they just they don't like Brock. No, no, no. In fact, it was John Elway a week ago today. I asked him the question, where would Brock rank in this year's quarterback class? And he said, right near the top, if not at the top. He'd be the top quarterback, in my opinion, in this year's draft class, assuming another 4,000-yard season, 25 touchdowns, what have you. Uh, Zach Dysart comes in, and again, Good teams, thinking about developing quarterbacks. Dysart is a tough player who showed improvement through coaching changes at Miami of Ohio. Broke a lot of Roethlisberger's records. I saw him at the Senior Bowl. Real up and down, mostly down in my opinion, and a very ugly release. Most of the times passes will flutter at the end. His passes were fluttering as they came out of his hand. So he seemed a little nervous. And talking to other folks uh, that were out there at the Senior Bowl, it was like, well, Dysart seemed like, you know, the, the stage was really grand for him, and, and he was a little bit nervous from that, a little shaken up. But still, I understand the pick. Developmental guys automatically better than Caleb Haney was as your third guy last year. Any thoughts on these seventh rounders, Bloom, and, and throw in any undrafted guys, too, as we sure. wrap up the show? Well, f for fantasy, you got to watch what Matt Scott does just because he's a good running quarterback, and he's also at Jacksonville, where this is one of the teams that didn't draft a quarterback. They didn't take Barkley or Nassib. They took, uh, at the top of the second round, they took Jonathan Cyprian. They didn't take Geno Smith. Uh, so, you know, this is a team that uh, didn't opt for that. And I, I, I go back and watch the Stanford tape. That's all I can say. If you like Tyler Wilson's mental toughness and physical toughness, you'll love Matt Scott. Uh, I like Ryan Griffin in Tulane. Doesn't have to just go straight down the street to the Superdome. I think you take the streetcar from Tulane to the Superdome. Uh, <laughs> so you can just get in that streetcar and go right down there. Uh, and so I like Griffin a lot. See, so we watched him at Texas versus the nation. Right. Um, and uh, he does cut the ball through the air. His passes don't flutter. Uh, he's And they made a great backup quarterback out of Chase Daniel, an, an undrafted free agent quarterback. So I'm interested there. Dysert's interesting, and I agree with you that Dysert's not a threat to Brock Osweiler per se, but if Osweiler's development stalls out, there is someone that they can be comparing him to in camp at least. So that, that's, that's a little bit of an obstruction. Hopefully it causes Osweiler to up his game. I know that Josh Norris from RotoWorldNFL.com had Dysert very high. I'm gonna Number have two. Him Yep. I'm going to have him and Dane Brugler on the couch tomorrow night to discuss the draft and get his take on, on why he fell and maybe why he shouldn't have fell. Uh, so we'll, we'll see about Dysert on that. BJ Daniels makes sense for San Francisco as an athletic quarterback uh, that could run the read option, or maybe they'll do something else with him. I don't know. Seventh round picks are four picks like that. You know, just, just trigger, I don't know, do something. See what works out. You know, Bryce Brown. I mean, maybe he doesn't care about football anymore, but we'll see. Uh, so I, I think these are are going to be interesting guys to watch about Brian Free. Um, I think San Diego drafted Brad Sorensen. Is that right? Yes. Um, and Sorensen, I broke him down for Bleacher Report. Big and a big arm. NFL says, whoa, who, where? Big and a big arm? We'll check that out. You know, seventh round pick. And again, San Diego, Pittsburgh Giants with these class of 2004 quarterbacks. It's nine years later. It's time to start thinking about the future. So, you know, I, I think that it's interesting to watch how these guys go. And I know Cease will be talking about all of them when they get on the field in the preseason. Yeah, definitely can't wait for that and can't wait for the audible complete NFL draft recap as I block the screen with my hand. Complete NFL draft recap coming up on the Audible. We'll record them today and tomorrow. Get that out for you. The hotness there on iTunes. And uh, I like I like uh, breaking the seal here, Bloom, on the Google Hangouts. This has been fun, brother. I just can't pick my nose while we're anymore while we're talking. <laughs> so, uh, so I have to definitely watch my etiquette, folks. Uh, if it's a little rocky at first, if I show you a little more than you might have wanted to see, please forgive me. Yeah, I'm going to have to do shows with my shirt on now. So... Uh, here you go. 
get my shirt this week. We'll be back with more Google Hangouts, more NFL talk as always. Brought to you by footballguys.com. For the great Sigmund Bloom, I am Cecil Lammy saying thanks very much for watching. Stay tuned. Stay frosty. <laughs>